Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Uh, today we'll be discussing a case of an elderly male who was brought to our ER with complaints of decreased response. So there was this 84-year-old male patient who was brought to the ER with a uh, decreased response. But a little dig into the history, we find out that the patient actually had left-sided hemiparesis along with angle of mouth deviation to the right side the previous day. So he was brought the next day because despite this he had like and along with this he also had decreased response. He was taken to a nearby hospital but nothing much was done and um, since there was a drop in sensorium he was shifted to our hospital. So in our initial 10 second uh, um, response the uh, assessment the patient was found to be only responsive to pain. Uh, so uh, airway wise it appeared to be patent but since the patient had decreased response, um, it could be compromised at any point in time. But there was no C-spine abnormality as such that was obviously noted. Breathing-wise, he had air entry to be bilaterally equal, but creptations were present predominantly on the left side. On it, inspection, how can you know that C-spine is normal? Like any bruises or anything wasn't noted. So tenderness and all, we didn't palpate him yet. Only as, as such, there was no obvious deformity or uh, okay. bruises seen. Okay. So breathing wise, he had a creptation on the left side. It could be secondary to either aspiration or an underlying infection. Uh, respiratory rate was 24 cycles per minute with a saturation of 95% on room air. So at this point, he was only put on a prop to position in the left lateral side and put on nasal prongs. Mm. Then circulation wise, he had a, um, heart, a tachycardia with a heart rate of 126 beats per minute with a blood pressure of 140 over 90. Uh, beats were regular in rhythm and all peripheral pulses were palpable. So disability wise he had a GCS of E2, V2, M5 which totaled to 9 over 15. And pupils however were bilaterally reactive and symmetrical in size of 2.5 mm each. Uh, exposure wise he was running temperature of 100.4 but GI, uh, blood sugar levels was high. It only showed high. We couldn't get the value on the glucometer. So, so far what we have is a patient who is tachycardic, who is also having fever and he also has high blood sugar level. Uh, and uh, since patient had low sensorium, proper neurological examination as such could not be assessed. In a patient who is having hyperglycemia with coma, this is coma? Yes, sir. What are the differential diagnoses? One patient can have a hyperglyc... It can be either HHS, hyperosmolar, non-ketotic uh, um, com um, coma. coma. Okay. Or it can be secondary to infections itself. Oh, decay. Decay, decay or HHS? HHS okay. or infections itself can okay. trigger hyperglycemia okay. and like meningitis or sepsis leading to uh, decreased neurological um, okay. function. Then um, if the patient is on steroids... Hyperglycemia. How can they become unconscious? Cerebral edema. No? Stroke. 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 Uh, Third important cause is stroke. always stroke. Mm. Because there are many patients who are having hyperglycemia. What will happen to the viscosity of blood? Increases. That increases. So, uh, thrombosis will one be. One of high. the major complications is thrombosis, whether it is in heart, that is myocardial infarction, stroke, DVT. Permanent embolism, all these things can happen. Okay. Yeah. Or simple stroke itself can produce decay or HHS. Okay. Okay. So then uh, moving on to our uh, systemic examination as such, we found that the patient was having regular breathing uh, rhythm and bilaterally air entry was equal with crepitations noted. There was no increase in the neck veins uh, and uh, no bruises or any discoloration or peculiar odor that was noted. And patient was tachycardic with regular heart rhythm but hemodynamically stable. Um, that's about it. So, neurological examination wise, he had a uh, left sided plantar response, but uh, a power as such could not be uh, noted except that the patient had decreased tone. Mm -hmm. Reflexes, however, were present. Mm -hmm. what, is, uh, what is the role of primitive reflexes in this type of patients? Um, what, is, what are primitive reflexes? You know? Those are the baby uh, pediatric uh, first reflexes that come, like the Moro's reflex, the glabella okay. tap. Okay. If they so retain. One of the problem in elderly individual is dementia. Dementia. So many patients can have dementia with uh, uh, all these uh, uh, primitive reflexes positive. 
So you may think that he is unconscious or he is not responding. So if you have, if you know, you have to check for primitive reflexes. Okay. okay. And thanks to primary survey, uh, ABG was taken, which showed a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. What is ABG? Which, uh, with pH of seven point three three, okay. bicarbonate was thirteen point four. PCO2 is 25.6. Okay. PO2 so that is was 88. So acidosis 88. where uh, with uh, without any compensation. That's right, sir. Okay. And uh, lactate was 1.4. Okay. Uh, PO2 88.5 and SO2 was 96. Okay. Uh, then apart from that, we also sodium. had a, uh, sodium 132.5 okay. with a potassium of 5.3. So what would be the corrected sodium in this patient? Uh, considering we didn't really get a value of GRBS, so okay, it is generally say, more than six hundred. In the GRBS, uh, RBC is eight hundred. More than uh, uh, undetectable means uh, high means it's small, mostly more than five hundred. Five hundred. Regular glucometer. So it is suppose it is eight hundred. Mm. Mm. What it is the patient is having one thirty two uh, in uh, is normal. Blood as a sodium. sodium uh, How do you calculate? Uh, so for um, actually sodium and glucose have the similar co-transportation. So if at all there is hyperglycemia, uh, sodium levels go down. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to calculate the corrected sodium. So with every um, 100 milligram per deciliter above 100, mm -hmm. you will have to add, uh, subtract um, sodium. Right. We'll have to add right. sodium with 1.6. 1.6 up to, for, for up to 400. 400. After that, it will become 2. 2. 2.8. So, 2. 8. 2. so 2. average 5. you just add 2. Hmm. So here suppose it is 800. You add 14. Hmm. 14 to your base value that is 132.5. 132. So it will be hyperglycemia. Hypernatremia. Hi Hypernatremia. Sorry. Hypernatremia indicates what? That uh, now the patient should not be given. Um, Hypernatremia indicates what? Dehydration. 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 So that is the most important thing. And anybody who is having high blood sugar and the sodium levels are even normal value you have to always think HHS that is because he is in a severe dehydrated state. state uh, what is the basic difference between HHS and DK? As well in DK patient can have near or absolute insulinopenia okay. but in HHS there will be some amount of insulin, insulin. Okay. which is why it will prevent lipolysis and uh, protein okay. breakdown ketone, but it will not be enough for not glucose be, utilization. Okay. Ketones so ketone won't be produced. Are not formal. But in water deficit, uh, what DK, is the DK is free. Uh, ketones are produced because water deficit. In terms of water deficit, uh, what is the difference? More, 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 in, uh, more very high. Eight, uh, in, uh, eight to ten liters of uh, deficiency will be there in HHS. HHS. So that's why we have to be very careful. Fluid re replacement is the most important treatment in HHS. HHS. Here also it is important. Here insulin fluid replacement. Sorry, fluid replacement. Insulin, potassium corrections Correction. are more important. Yes, okay. So, uh, with this, uh, apart from this, uh, ECG was taken which showed sinus tachycardia and features of LBBB. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know whether it was new onset or old onset. So, we sent for a, a set of cardiac enzymes and uh, Scarbosa criteria was not met. So, it didn't really look like it was any myocardial infarction and uh, Cardiac enzymes what came back negative. What concordant pattern and discordant pattern in LBV? Uh, sir, in um, concordant pattern, all the waves will be in the one direction. Means uh, V5, V6, e if QRS is positive, if e T is also positive, positive, then it is? Concordant. If T is negative, then discordant, which is hmm. uh, uh, more in favor of ischemic, uh, acute ischemia. Concord concordance concordant is more in favor thing. of acute myocardial okay. infarction. Uh. Concordance. Mm. Both QRS and uh, SG segment on towards same side. Mm. Suppose it is M pattern, uh, T will be upright. upright. If it is W pattern, T will be negative. negative. That is concordance. concordance. That is more in favor of a myocardial mm. infarction. Mm. Cardiac enzymes came back to be negative. So, okay. uh, so apart from this, MRI stroke protocol was also done, uh, but it ruled out any acute infarct. So, patients' uh, clinical features of hemiparesis in the background of hyperglycemia was attributed towards HHS. Okay. So, now a diagnosis of HHS was made and uh, point of care um, complete blood count showed total counts as 13.1 with a CRP of 98. So, some grade of infection was also there, possible lower. Infection. CRP oh. just tells you that inflammation. Oh. But fever is also there. Sir. Fever can be there. Oh. 
but it is an inflammation <laughs> inflammation is mostly in our experience it will be mostly infection infection okay so um chest x ray was taken which showed left lower zone consolidation mm-hmm. so so far we have a patient with lower respiratory tract infection consolidation left lower lo- lobe lower lobe consolidation with hhs okay. so now the possible trigger either uh, now at this point either a stroke could have triggered hhs or hhs could have uh presented as a hemiparesis or hemianopsia features okay. and uh, the major difference between hhs and dk in terms of clinical features are neurological uh, depression will be very profound in hhs in comparison to um dk so patient will pre- present with stupor coma or altered mental uh, status both are actually common diabetic ketoacidosis is also comatic and the other one is also coma mm-hmm. but it is more profound in uh, yeah, hhs hhs so then then um in the lab investigation wise dk uh, is more common in youngsters type 1 is more common type 2 elderly individuals uh-huh. okay type 1 and type 2 is separate type 1 it is very common but we, most of the case what we are seeing in our practice is type 2 only very rarely we see type 1 okay but type 2 itself dk is more common in a youngster but it is is very very common in uh, elderly, elderly individuals, individuals. Okay. so um lab investigation wise uh, in um, blood sugar levels um, patient will have more than 250 mg per deciliter in dk mm-hmm. whereas it will be more than 600 in cases of hhs and blood sugar then sugar is very high in hhs and uh, slightly, slightly high, high in dk and then ketone serum ketones will be strongly positive in dk whereas it will be either trace or negative in hhs okay. um acidosis level um, ph will be generally more than 7.3 in hhs and it will be acidotic like less than 7.3 what 7. are the reasons for acidosis in a patient who is in hyperglycemic coma one can be alcoholic ketoacidosis okay. starvation starvation um then um patient can have any toxicology like uh, okay, alcohol alcohol or um, methanol or patient can end up with that ethylene uh, glycol toxicity okay, metformin toxicity um, uremia ckd uremia, lactic acidosis lactic acidosis the most common association is always lactic, lactic acidosis. acidosis sepsis lactic acidosis and dk also dk or hhs also can be associated so all acid, acidosis in dk sorry hyperglycemia are not dk it can be various other causes also mm. okay uh, here lactate was 1.4 sir so it was normal okay. so then um, ketone go- bodies can be positive in other conditions than dk yes so anyway there is keto acidosis like starvation, starvation alcoholic ketoacidosis so pregnancy it can be positive so it's some, most of the time it will be mixer of everything mm. we will mm. not be able to make a proper diagnosis in some conditions but mm. whatever it is treatment is almost same mm. and bicarbonate will generally be more than 18 in cases of hhs whereas patient with dk can have severe acidosis <coughs> also but uh, another major difference is osmolarity will be very high in in um, hhs and not so high in uh, plasma uh, dk they can be sodium. sodium 320 more than 340 millimol per uh, liter it will be there in Mm, hhs so okay. this would be the lab investigation wise the difference okay. and pathogenesis like i said uh, near or absolute insulinopenia will be seen in dk okay. whereas in hhs there will be some amount of insulin that will curb lipolysis and protein breakdown but will not be enough for glucose utilization okay. so even though there is high amount of glucose in the body in the blood it won't be able, uh, cells won't be able to utilize it okay. so the already Why these patients develop dehydration uh so there are uh, basically uh, osmotic diuresis will also happen there is a main reason uh, but in elderly individual uh, one intake will also intake be less will be severely reduced this occurs mainly patients who are not taken care properly mm. so when we discuss the pathogenesis insulin and uh, glu- uh, glucagon are two contradicting or counter regulatory hormones mm. insulin is the only anabolic hormone which is secreted by the pancreas which helps in fluid storage so all the glucose gets either utilized in the cells and it will mainly act on skeletal muscles liver and adipose tissue and it helps in glycogen uh, formation or fat formation and protein formation but when insulin is not there then the existing fuel storage gets utilized and glucose will be underutilized so because of that glucagon is further 
प्रोड्यूस्ड एंड दैट अगेन कॉज ग्लाइकोजीनोलाइसिस ग्लूकोन्योजेनेसिस सो प्रोटीन ब्रेक्स डाउन हैपन फ्री फैटी सेल्स विल बी देयर नाउ दैट विल बी बाउंड टू एल्ब्यूम एंड इट विल बी टेकन टू द लिवर वेर बीटा ऑक्सीडेशन हैपन्स एंड कीटोन बॉडीज आर प्रोड्यूस्ड ओनली बिकॉज ग्लूकोज के नॉट बी यूटिलाइज सो बॉडी स्टार्ट टू लुक फॉर अदर फ्यूल सोर्सेज दैट्स हाउ फैट्स एंड बॉड प्रोटीन्स गेट यूज अप सो कीटोन बॉडीज लाइक बीटा हाइड्रोक्सीब्यूटेट एसिटोस्टिक एसिड एसिटोन विल बी प्रोड्यूस्ड सो दिस इज सेल्युलर ब्लड सीरम सीरम क्यूरोन यूरिन आल्सो कैन बी पॉजिटिव सर बट यूरिन इज अ डिसएडवांटेज ऑफ यूरिन इट विल बी अफेक्टेड बाय वेरियस अदर फैक्टर्स जस्ट डिहाइड्रेट एंड इट कैन बी पॉजिटिव फॉर अ रियली लॉन्ग टाइम देन सीरम कैन बी पॉजिटिव फॉर लॉन्ग टाइम सपोज देयर इज कंप्लीट रेनल शटडाउन और किडनी इज नॉट वर्किंग प्रॉपर्ली इट मे नॉट बी सीन इन यूरिन सो देयर आर टू रीजन वन समटाइम्स यू यू डोंट सी इट इन यूरिन Sometimes it can persist for a longer time than the serum. So serum. serum gives exactly the same picture. Whenever it appears, you can get it. Whenever it disappears, it can disappear from the lab investigation. So in HHS, the main problem is glucose is underutilized. Now because of uh, worsening hyperglycemia, patient will also end up with osmotic diuresis. Uh, when in terms of polydipsia, polyuria, weight loss, all of that will happen. But it's insidious onset. It's not very acute. And then um, apart from this, there will be pre-renal azotemia mm-hmm. uh, because of excessive uh, again osmotic diuresis and protein breakdown. Azotemia, so uremia. Yeah. Ah, you remain. You remain. You too. Again, a uh, protein breakdown, amino acids, and all urea gets formed. You remain is due to mainly due to the renal failure. Renal. Uh. Renal. What you told is correct. Pre renal mm. kidney failure. Kidneys mm. are not getting effective circulation, mm. so kidney will go to failure. Okay, that produces. Mm. uremia then along with uh, as- osmotic diuresis patient can have po- uh, potassium losses phosphate loss and uh, bicarbonate loss mm-hmm. because of this patient ends up in acidosis and chloride gets retained mm-hmm. so on acidosis patient can have worsening hypernatremia and worsening cellular uh, dehydration oh. so this would be the pathogenesis now in clinical features like i said hhs will be more profoundly uh, it will present as neurological uh, dysfunction seizures, seizures or hemiparesis okay. hemi- hemianopsia mm-hmm. like that and then weight loss poly uh, dipsia polyuria the triggering factors will be one patient is not taking adequate insulin or uh, patient has um, uh, infection pregnancy mi cva pulmonary embolism all of these can trigger And dehydration due to any dehydration sometimes patient may not be taking Adequate. sometimes patient have uh, large volume urine loss uh-huh. or hyperthyroidism cushing syndrome pheochromocytoma all of this can trigger uh, both dka and hhs now coming to the management part in hhs it is predominantly just fluid replacement so before we do the fluid fluid replacement we'll have to see the sodium um, correction okay. so if the uh, corrected sodium is more than uh, 140 then we prefer half ns over isotonic saline okay. so uh, fluid is replaced if the then the other factor is the hemodynamic stability if the patient is in cardiogenic shock then uh, control fluids and vasopressors will be given okay. but if the patient is in hypovolemic shock then a uh, rapid fluid bolus will be given but if the patient is severely dehydrated with no signs of shock then fluid is given um with 15 to 20 ml per kg per hour so roughly about 1000 ml per hour but it should not proceed more than uh, 50 ml per kg in the first 4 hours hmm. and then depending upon the fluid status we uh, taper the fluid replacements accordingly so you give fluids mm. especially when there is a decay decay you give normal saline mm. hhs you give half, half normal saline. Saline. okay mm. so when you start that normally mm. what will happen to the sugar sugar levels will come down okay normally when you start fluid itself you can sugar see levels. sugars are dropping down mm. How, what is the expected or target sugar drop 100 you, 100 mg per deciliter in 1 hour. hour so whether you start insulin or uh, fluid alone should not uh, drop it more than 100 mm. if you d- rapidly drop the sugar what will happen uh, one our purpose is to correct acidosis sir that is not hap- uh, glu- patient will go into hypoglycemia cerebral edema cerebral edema that is common in adults or pediatrics so the one is uh, you avoid cerebral edema second mm. thing rapid drop of sugar can present 
patient can rapidly go to hypoglycemia. hypoglycemia. That is also bad. Mm. So our agenda is one to uh, improve the patient's mental status and mm. second is to correct the acidosis. Okay. So it's not to rapidly bring down the glucose levels. So at this point in time, we start insulin. But before we start insulin, we see the potassium levels. If potassium okay. in this case, like in this case, is more than 5.3, okay. we can just safely start insulin. Okay. But if it falls in the normal range of 3.5 to 5, then we start insulin along with simultaneous correction of potassium okay. but if it is less than potassium is less than 3.5 or 3.3 then we first correct potassium and then start the patient on insulin what happens to the potassium if you give insulin again because of uh, shift in the uh, potassium shift into the cells there will be hypokalemia worsening okay, hypokalemia when you are insulin normally hypo- hypokalemia. Hy- hypokalemia happens so we start insulin now e- uh, we can either start with 0.1 kg uh, 0.1 unit po- po- 0.1 uh, international unit per kg iv bolus dose. yeah okay. iv bolus so followed you give, uh, 0.1 unit per kg means uh, 70 kg patients 7 seven units. units bolus or infusion? iv bolus we can start after that uh, continuous infusion with uh, 0.1 units per kg per hour and then we keep checking the glucose levels every 2 hours uh-huh. and then once the sugar and it should not fall more Normally than 100 it is every 1 hour Yeah. Initially. Initially. then only you reduce to 2 hours, hours. because 1 hour itself our target is 1 hour in 1 hour it should not drop less than 100, 100 mg maximum 150 100 to 150 is the maximum so to know that every hour you have to check it check uh. so once another major difference between dk and hhs management is in dk when only when the sugar levels falls below 200 we start on dextrose uh, containing uh, iv fluids uh. but in hhs when it comes to less than 250 to 300 itself we'll start dextrose containing fluids until the acidosis all of that is corrected okay. and patient sensorium improves so then so what is that protocol called as delta delta protocol. delta protocol delta protocol delta protocol is the best protocol we can adjust the sugar mm-hmm. otherwise uh, the uh, sugar in hundreds like uh, 700 means by 100 will give the infusion rate that is simplest formula 700 by 100 7 units per hour mm-hmm. next hour if it is 600 600 by 100 6 units mm-hmm. if after 1 hour of infusion if the sugars are same or increased you have to double, double the, dose. the dose that is the only thing but uh, if you go according to delta protocol you can exactly enter your blood sugar value and you get a infusion rate so then um, apart from um, then in, uh, fluids are given then insulin will be initiated if you put insulin in a normal uh, bottle what will happen here we are giving in infusion pumps pumps we are putting no, some of sediments some of it they push the insulin precipitate normal normal saline bottle and give it as a infusion what happens will precipitate infusion sir. adhere to the bottle bottle mm-hmm. sides it will adhere okay. so whatever you are uh, putting it may not be completely utilized in that mm-hmm. type of bottles mm-hmm. you need to have special uh, Uh, injection system for that mm. but uh, we put it in infusion pump so only loss will be minimal okay. so. and then once the sugar levels have come down to less than 250 to 300 we change half ns or ns to or dextrose containing fluids okay. and that we will infuse at 200 ml per uh, ml per hour rate and then uh, sugar levels have to be kept between 140 to 180 or 200 mm-hmm. range and uh, then we assess the patient's overall general condition improvement in the patient's clinical feces because all of these are reversible once the patient's sugar levels are brought under control oh. then um, electrolytes will have to check and then uh, electrolyte is most important in diabetes control potassium no, sodium potassium is important for in insulin initially okay. diabetic control which electrolyte is more electrolyte or mineral which is which electrolyte mineral is more important for the action of insulin one mineral is very very important that will be mostly low in diabetic patients magnesium because magne- uh, insulin to enter the cells magnesium is required that's why you see many patients magnesium levels will be very low magnesium loss will be very high in diabetic patients so magnesium levels always should be checked and corrected the other thing is the trigger so one it could either be the lower respiratory tract infection one it can be either aspiration so here you have pneumonia. a patient who is having pneumonia mm. dk is okay but how do you treat this patient 
pneumonia one uh, will check the hypoxic levels mm-hmm. then supplement the patient with oxygen and antibiotics mm-hmm. not antibiotics uh, majorly gram negative coverage because so patient is diabetic gram negative coverage uh, so fluoroquinolones will be fluoroquinolones can be given you can be used what is the coverage of fluoroquinolone um gram negative and atypical Gram positive, gram negative, atypical, atypical. anaerobes, everything atypical. it will cover. Okay, levofloxacin or moxifloxacin. Mm-hmm. Or uh, um, macrolides like azithromycin can be used, oh. which has an anti-inflammatory action even on the lungs. Which are, which are, which are quinolones or uh, respiratory quinolones? Uh, levofloxacin, moxifloxacin. Mm-hmm. Other things, uh, uh, offloxacin, That is majorly uh, GI. That is below diaphragm. Below diaphragm. Uh, offloxacin. Ofloxacin, ciprofloxacin, norfloxacin. They are also quinolones, but they have predominantly gram-negative coverage. Gram. This one has got gram-positive, gram gram-negative, gram atypical, anaerobes, everything is there. That's why that is, uh, nowadays we use quinolones for all respiratory infections. So then antibiotics is initiated on this patient uh, as the patient had... Piprazilin disobactum. Uh, Piprazilin disobactum. Oh. Uh, cardiac enzymes first set was negative sir serum ketones first reading was trace subsequent readings was negative okay. crp was 97 so but when will you switch to uh, subcutaneous insulin in this uh, so once the patient all our targets have been achieved like patient has regained full sensorium mm-hmm. and uh, patient has no, no longer in dehydration state and then uh, patient other electrolytes all have normalized and patient is maintaining blood sugar levels then in that case we our target is to keep so it once the patient starts taking orally hemodynamically stable everything is stable if he starts taking orally you can easily convert to subcutaneous insulin what subcutaneous insulin you start for this patient short acting mm-hmm. like a uh, regular insulin is getting 100 units per day insulin infusion how do you give so your we insulin we calculate the entire insulin how intake do you switch to insulin subcutaneous uh, we take 50% as basal and bolus then when the patient is already on insulin infusion we give subcutaneous recheck after 1 hour mm-hmm. and then if it is so normal it has to we be stop overlap that time Okay, that also you have to be uh, like very careful. Suppose 100 units, you divide whatever you where, where you want. Suppose you are giving Actrapid, 5 times you can give, 6 times you can give, 3 times you can give. Minimum duration is 3 times. Okay, so some patients may require 5 times or 6 times subcutaneous. So, first dose should be given along with insulin infusion. Then mm-hmm. after half an hour to 1 hour, you stop the infusion. then you decide your treatment whatever it is 100 units the patient is getting insulin infusion mostly 75 units subcutaneous may be required or 100 itself may be required that you can di- divide according to patient's diet pattern suppose you are giving three times food in ic three times are enough suppose you are giving five times food in your ic five times may be required some mm. patients may require intermittent bolus but it should never be depending on your sugar value sugar. that is sliding scale that mm. is not correct you okay. give insulin regularly every day suppose you are giving 10 10 10 that only you give today and tomorrow only you have to change the dose according to the uh, today's sugar value tomorrow you can change okay sir okay mm. so how much insulin he was getting uh, sir initially he was getting a uh, daily uh, it was over 100 sir or uh, 150 okay. so It more was, than 100 units indicates what in a patient who is getting un Uncon- um, um, poor sugar control what is it hb no. there is a name for that insulin resistance insulin resistance so these patients they may not get controlled with regular insulin so insulin resistance means a patient who is getting large volume of insulin that is uh, more than 100 units that patients may require what type of insulin what is this resistance resistance means there are antibodies produced against human insulin mm-hmm. so if whatever insulin you are giving that will be neutralized by the antibodies so this type of patients may require other type of insulin another type of insulin what is that type they are called as analog insulins analog insulin is newer insulin they can be rapid acting slow acting ultra long acting and different drugs are there but they are genetically engineered they are not human insulins mm. that structure is taken but genetically engineered modified 
the antibodies cannot destroy this insulin. So if you are giving more than 100 units in a day, you have to be very careful. Your regular insulin may not, regular insulin or human insulin may not work. Okay, so in that case, you have to give uh, analog insulins. So analog mm -hmm. insulin advantage is they are they cannot be destroyed by your antibodies. Okay. Then over span. So somebody is taking analog insulin already. Already, mm -hmm. he's having that bottle or vial with you with him. Can you continue regular as this analog insulin as an infusion? If somebody is taking analog insulin, you can continue it. No need to change to. Uh, your regular, uh, regular insulin. insulin. You give analog insulin as an infusion, but mm -hmm. not long acting. Short acting analog insulin can be given as a infusion, like normal insulin you are giving. That can be given if the patient is already on. If the patient is not on uh, uh, analog insulin, there is not much difference between regular insulin and analog insulin in an acute stage. Okay, but if it is more than hundred, you should remember that there is a possibility of insulin resistance syndrome. Is there any clinical mark for marking for insulin resistance syndromes? Hmm? Can the snagricans, what is that? Oh, uh, the, those are velvet black color, marks. Black velvet uh, color marking on uh, the back, snagricans. So if that is there, you have to be very careful. That patient definitely will have insulin resistance syndrome. Mm. Okay, sir. So what happened to this patient ultimately? He over a span of 24 hours, he regained his consciousness mm -hmm. and then uh, full sensorium he is maintaining. So now we have to put him on subcutaneous doses. Uh, this is case of? HHS. HHS. With LRDA. Difference is ketone body. Ketone, negative. not negative in that. And, uh, a little dig into sample so history. Can you give so IM, IM or subcutaneous insulin in acute condition? No, uh, because yes. patient will be dehydrated. Okay. So, even so if that you is the only problem. If we are giving insulin in a dehydrated patient as subcutaneous, it will not be absorbed. That is the only problem. Otherwise, there is no much difference. It is same as uh, sub. So, you give 100 units of subcutaneous. In one hour, it will get absorbed to the, your blood system. Okay, mm -hmm. but if you are already dehydrated, then it will not get absorbed. It will be like an ultra long acting insulin. Mm -hmm. In renal failure patients, what care you should take when you are treating with insulin? A long acting insulin gets broken. Even short acting thing. will become long, long acting. acting. So that you have to be very careful. Mm -hmm. So instead of uh, using very high dose in normal person. In renal failure patients, you have, very, the very dose. Like you have to take care and mm. you have to reduce the dose. He is already a known case of CKD, sir. And along with that, he has a CAD, uh, coronary artery disease and hypertensive diabetic dyslipidemic also. And he's had a history of TIA also in the month of September. So either a stroke can trigger hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia can trigger stroke. So that's it, sir. He's improving now. Thank you. Anything you want to add? Anything you want to add? Nothing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.